Welcome into another edition of Hand Raised Guys, presented by Comer Heating and Air, Southern Air Conditioning and Heating. I'm Neil McCready. Today on the show, I'm joined by Ryan Brown of The Next Round and Olin Buchanan of TexAgs.com. It's a football-heavy show. I think you'll enjoy as we head into the Memorial Day weekend. First, let me tell you about Comer and Southern. They've got different names, but they offer the same people, the same great products, and the same great services that uh, you should expect as uh, we get into the summer months. You want to make sure that air conditioning uh, unit is running at tip-top shape. The heat is coming, so you want to be ready. If you live in Oxford, Batesville, Tupelo, or the surrounding area, get in touch with Comer, 662-801-1777. If you live in Hernando, Memphis, or the surrounding area, call Southern at 662-429-4429. This will be the Friday Oxford Exxon podcast. The Oxford Exxon on Highway 6 in Oxford will be a great place to help your Memorial Day barbecue load up on your beverages of choice. Let the Oxford Exxon handle your ribs, both wet and dry. The Oxford Exxon has delicious ribs to help you celebrate the holiday. I'm coming to you from the Clark Ford Studio. 662-257-1900 is the number. Call it. Ask for our buddy Corey Clark. Tell Corey what Ford product you're looking for. He'll send you a quote within 15 minutes in business hours. It's right to the bottom line. There's no hassle. There's no haggle. You get your quote. And the rest is completely up to you. You can shop that quote around or you can do what I've done, what I recommend that you do, and that's hop into a Clark Ford today. He gets great service, great product. Corey and the people at Clark Ford want to be your car guy. They want to be a truck guy. They'll prove to you what it means when you make the call, 662-257-1900. All guests join on the MyPerfectFranchise.net hotline. If you're a displaced corporate executive wanting to put your career in your own hands, or maybe you're an experienced entrepreneur simply looking to diversify. Either way, Andy Ludicky can help. Andy owns multiple franchises and businesses. He uses his expertise to help others find their American dream through a very thorough and free consultation process. So call Andy, put your life and your career in your own hands. It's 100% free. You've got nothing to lose. Find your perfect franchise at myperfectfranchise.net. Contact Andy anytime at andy at myperfectfranchise.net or call 404 404- Nine seven three nine nine zero one. First up on the MyPerfectFranchise.net hotline, my friend Ryan Brown. Enjoy. <clears throat> Ryan Brown of the next round joins us. Ryan, it's been a minute. How you been? I am awesome, Neil. How are things going for you? Um, you know what? I, can, I, I can't really complain. I guess I probably could complain. Nobody would listen, but... Uh, been a busy few days here at the house there's been a lot of stuff going on a lot of people in and out of the house but it's finally hitting a resolution point and that's good so yeah you know i had a i know you just had a college graduation um i had a high school graduation my oldest daughter just graduated high school so um you know i graduated high school in 1994 uh, so i'm an old man and i had not experienced a graduation since it has changed a lot since I graduated high school, Neil. Oh, I'm it curious. A, it, it, I'm curious if we're going where I think we're going. Uh, uh, it's a month long celebration now. Like okay. everybody has graduation parties, uh, including my daughter. And you know, hers was very low key. She's not like some, you know, like you know, Sweet Sixteen on MTV, that old show or whatever. My Sweet Sixteen, whatever that show was. So she's very low key. But we we had a party at the house. You know, you've you've got your church ceremony um thank god she's an honor student so the honor ceremony um the awards night they got a thing where they do a golden apple for the teacher you know your favorite teacher through school oh honor students get to award a golden apple it felt like it was something every night for the entire month of may up until graduation last night now i have no idea where you thought i was going but that's where i was going okay so yes that has changed a lot um it felt like and I wasn't there because Campbell was at Arkansas and it wasn't here, but it felt like every single night for the entire spring semester was a celebration of something, which is yeah. hey, any excuse yeah. to party in college. I get it. That's right. That's right. Um, the ceremony itself at the high school level, and I don't know where your daughter went to school. I know that my, I have a nephew that graduated from Chelsea high school on, um, we're taping this on Wednesday. He, he graduated on Tuesday night. So it's, it, this is graduation season. But the, 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 each person is introduced and in this battle to, to cheer, even though everyone is asking, hey, let's have some decorum. 
Yeah. Let's, let's not make this a, a, a battle to see who could bring the most people and the loudest people to the ceremony. I don't know. When I graduated from Ruston High School back in the Stone Age, um, they, they, they read the name off the tablet. And then you you came across and you got your your degree, and you left. And then they asked for you for the, everyone to wait until the end of this, of the last one from A to Z, and then there was a, a rousing round of applause. And if yeah. I remember correctly, and this is 1988, if I remember correctly, that was honored. Um, I did not walk at my college graduation. I made up an excuse and went home. I didn't I didn't go through the 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 pomp and circumstance at Ole Miss. Uh, a year and a half later, my uncle was giving the um, the commencement signature speech, whatever that's called. Yeah. And so I had no choice but to walk at my graduate school uh, uh, graduation. And once again, at, at University of Louisiana Monroe, they asked everyone to wait till the end. And if I recall correctly, and I perhaps recall wrongly, they did. Now, and at Oxford High School, it was it was bad. Every kid, they'd say, hey, we're not we're going to ask for you to do this. And then no, yeah. nobody, nobody enforced the rule. And it it felt like a cheerleading competition and people got kind of irritated and it sort of yeah. ruined the night a little. Yeah, I don't know what you do. Um, so the principal gets up and he does a uh, he does his principal's address. And right after that, it's when they announced, and it was a really good address. The principal, it's actually the same school your nephew graduated from. So okay. they graduated together. This was Tuesday. Yeah. So the principal does his address and a really good address. I was very impressed. This principal has impressed me. He's a nice guy. My daughter, you know, speaks highly of him. I, I you know, I, I really liked what he's done. And I thought it was a nice address, like five minutes, you know, very simple, but a good address. And I thought good advice for a graduating class. And then, uh, the, you know, they say, okay, it's time for what everybody came for to get your diploma. And then he says it. He's like, hey, listen, I know you're excited about your kids. If we could please hold the applause to the end. This is a very large graduating class, like 400 kids. You know, let's hold the applause to the end. Everyone deserves, you know, recognition. I want to make sure everybody gets their name heard. You know, we want to keep moving through this so it doesn't take forever. Um, you know, so, again, please hold your applause to the end. Um, and, and we'll applaud all these kids at the end. All right, let's get started. First name, valedictorian's name. I'm like, literally the man <laughs> just said it. So then it's quiet for a little while, but you know, Neil, here's what you know in these deals. The minute the first person does, you know, woo, pookie, all right. You know, the first time that happens, the seal is broken and everybody does it. So like, you know, it's, we're moving through the names, it's quiet. And I'm like, okay, we've done well, we've done well, we've done well. You know, Neil McCready, woo, Neil, oh! And I'm like, oh crap, there it goes. There it and is. From here on, from here on, everybody has been given free reign to yell their favorite nickname and tell them how proud they are of them. And all it does is slow everything down because now the lady reading the names, she's got to wait for it to die down so she can read the next name, which she should do. Everybody wants to hear their kid's name read. It's just, it is very, very frustrating, I admit. I'm not ready to throw fist over it by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm just like, okay, can we just let this go? Please, we don't have to yell for every kid. I mean, I'm not going to be old man yelling at Cloud, except I'm kind of the old man yelling at Cloud here. It's a matter of respect. It's a respect thing. And I know that's missing from our society today, and nobody cares, and people go, hey, yeah. of course we're problems. Listen, if this is the biggest accomplishment in the kid's life, the rest of this is big disappointment. You guys understand that, right? I mean, if if, yeah, that's right. yep. if graduating from pick your high school is the biggest moment in life, but there's exceptions, not many. If that's yeah. the biggest moment, eh, come on. Yeah, I, 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 mean, uh, I mean, you know, come I, I, on. I, I, yeah, and I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming, obviously. So I was prepared for it. And my little one, so I've got a, uh, I've got a nine year old. So I've got a high school senior and a third grader. Uh, and she'd never been to a graduation before. So when people started, like the first person that yelled, she, uh, she couldn't believe it. And then she starts laughing. She thinks they're hilarious. And, yeah. and I mean, that should, that should tell you something, by the way, that the grown man wasn't laughing. The nine year old thought it was hilarious. And so she couldn't get enough of it. Like my nine, my nine year old was disappointed when a name was called and nobody yelled anything, and, and, and my daughter just walked across the stage without us yelling. You know, she's she was shocked by that. So, uh, it is look. I mean, it only happens once. 
the only time she's ever going to graduate from high school. I'm very, very proud of her. I, you know, if people want to yell, let them yell, I guess. But it does drive me crazy. I'm going to say that. All right. Speaking of people yelling, are they going to be yelling at uh, Nick Saban and Tommy Reese here in a few months when the Alabama offense takes the field? Because, look, I, I did an interview the other day with Jared Ivey, the Ole Miss defensive end, and we were talking about different people that impressed him. And he kind of went on and on about Bryce Young. I went on and on about Bryce Young. The Carolina Panthers went on and on about Bryce Young. But he's not going to play for Alabama anymore, and that dude was a stud. Replacing him is a challenge. Um it, it feels like the, the Notre Dame sort of leftover stuff is is kind of an interesting philosophy, given Alabama's run of quarterbacks over the years. That it's going to be Buckner, Simpson, Milrow in some order. Yeah, I mean you got five guys in the room because you know you've got a couple talented freshmen that they really like too that are not going to compete for the starting job, but they're in that room too. I mean it is a crowded quarterback room. So this is kind of a complicated question because Ivy was probably too kind to say this, but Alabama fans feel like that for the last two years, Bill O'Brien's offense, which is, this is going to be weird to say because Bill O'Brien's been a successful NFL offensive coach. Like he might have been a failed coach of the Houston Texans, but it wasn't because their offense stunk. I mean, you know, Deshaun Watson was a really good quarterback in his system. Penn State it was in a terrible situation. They had some offense in a situation. Need I remind you of his work with the New England Patriots, right? So, I mean, this is a guy that has known offense for years and is a respected offensive coach, but I think Alabama fans felt like Alabama's offense, and there's a reason they felt like this. It did feel this way a lot of times. Alabama's offense for two years under Bill O'Brien was throw a bunch of crap against the wall to see what sticks. And if if by chance you get in a bind, Bryce Young will bail you out of it. And Bryce Young bailed him out of a lot of binds. He Dunaway uh, on our show, yeah, my, my, my co-host Jim, Jim Dunaway just shared it. I'm not going to have the exact years here, but he just shared an incredible stat. I think, I think it was, there was this run of years where Alabama played 11 one-score games, 11 of them. Um, and it was like a five or six-year run. I mean, Alabama just did not play a lot of one-score games. Bryce Young's two years, they played 10. So there was like this five or six-year window where they played 11 one-score games, and then Bryce Young's two years, they played 10 one-score games. Now, they were seven and three in those games, but they got in a lot of one-score games. Some of that was a defense that wasn't quite up to what Alabama has been, but a lot of it, too, was just an offense that at times would completely disappear and sputter. So I think Alabama fans are happy for a fresh start on that. The Tommy Reese hire underwhelmed a lot of people just because it wasn't like he was tearing it up in Notre Dame. And then you double down by going against the quarterback that only started three games there. Here's what I'll say about Buck. And I'll credit Connor O'Gara Saturday down south for pointing this out. The guys had one year as a starter. One year as a starter. So he was hurt one year in high school. He played his junior year where he had 6,000 total yards as a quarterback and like 80-some-odd touchdowns. Crazy numbers out in California. His senior year was canceled by COVID because, of course, it was in California. And he got hurt at Notre Dame. So, really, he's had one year as a starting quarterback. We really don't know what Tyler Buckner is. As a high school quarterback, it was tremendous in one year. We do this every year. I don't do it as much as other people, so I feel like I have a little bit of, of, of latitude here because, at least in my world, every week is Alabama Respect Week. Um, they've, they've won at a level, and I was in the state before Saban. And so when everybody goes, well, everybody wins at Alabama, I'm like, well, I covered a bunch of people who didn't. I mean, they won, but they didn't win like this. I mean, Mike DuBose didn't win like this. Uh, Mike Price obviously didn't win like this. Mike Shula didn't win like this. Dennis Franchoni did not win like this. They did not dominate the league. Um, that, that's a pretty decent time frame. Gene Stallings had a big year, but yeah. he didn't dominate the league. Yeah, Nick Saban has dominated the league, uh, at least to the point where his – uh, former disciple has dominated the last two years, but even in those two years, Alabama was was super competitive. Yet, this is the first year in a long time that going into like media days, nobody cares who we vote for, but this will be the first time in a long time that I actually look at the sheet of paper in front of me and go, well, am I picking Alabama? And I think I am, but I'm not as nearly yeah. as positive because I think I'm, at least considering the possibility of, of, of picking LSU because they, they've got a ton of talent. They've got a, a quarterback back in, in um, like two quarterbacks back from a year ago, Jaden Daniels and, 
and uh, the, the kid whose n- name is escaping me right now. But I mean, they, yeah, yeah, they've got so they've got those guys back, and I mean there are they have a, a very talented roster, and and it begins to feel to me like maybe Alabama for the first time has slipped just a little. Am I completely off? Uh, no, I mean, I think there is that feel. It's interesting. You either get one or two reads on that. Like, there are a lot of people that say, well, Alabama is slipping. And then some say, you know, this is the year you expect nothing out of Alabama. And then lo and behold, they're going to surprise everybody. I mean, that's kind of one of the one of the two, you know, thoughts you get on that. Um, I do. I'm with you. It'll be as close as it's been for Alabama and anybody else in the media mode for what that's worth with Alabama and LSU. I think you'll get Alabama because of the legacy. You'll get a lot of legacy votes for Alabama, and you'll get Alabama's hosting LSU. I mean, that is not an insignificant fact. No, true. That that game is that game is played in Brian Denny Stadium. So, um, so th- I think those two things will combine to have Alabama with the edge. But I think it'll be about as close as it's been, and I think rightfully so. I think LSU is very good. I am a Brian Kelly respecter. I think Brian Kelly's an excellent football coach. Jaden Daniels from the Florida State game to the end of the year was a totally different quarterback, mm-hmm. and I think he'd take another step forward. But uh, there are a lot of people that will say, doubt Alabama at your own peril, right? When you think Alabama has lost it, that's when Nick Saban is just going to surprise you. Uh, I don't know what to expect, though. I mean, normally I think I can get a pretty good feel for this Alabama team. I mean, normally just say, well, they're going to win 11 or 12 games. You're going to be right more often than you're not. This is the one year where 10 and 2 really feels like it's in play. Uh, I, you know, I, I do, I, I do the other side, though. I'll look and say, okay, well, where are the two? And those do become hard to find at times. But um, but I do I'm, I'm I got no problem with somebody saying I'm going to vote LSU in the West. I do think that game being at Brian Denny is is a factor though in your vote. Pete Golding is gone. He's here. So it's a twofold question: What do you expect different from Alabama's defense? Uh, Golding was there for a while, and then what impact do you anticipate Golding having at Ole Miss? Um, you know, I thought I thought Partridge had Ole Miss, and maybe I'm wrong from the outside looking in, but I thought he took a pretty step big step forward from DJ Durkin where Durkin left it. Am I wrong about that? I mean, that was kind of my view from over here. They were more talented. Um, they had more players. Um, at, at times they were, they were pretty good. Then there it's just some, sometimes it's hard to get that last taste out of your mind. You know, yeah. LSU scored at will in the second half. Um, Arkansas moved the football at will in the first half in Fayetteville, Mississippi state was able to, get those two drives late to, to, to win. And then Ole Miss kind of didn't show up in the, in the bowl game. And I don't, you know, what judges anything from the bowl game, but that's the last thing in your mind. a little. Yeah. Bit. So sometimes you kind of go, well, I don't know. Yeah. The, the, there's a chance Ole Miss had a slightly distracted coach in some of those games you mentioned uh, as a head coach, but it's possible. There's been some things written <laughs> about that. Uh, <laughs> I don't. Uh-huh. I don't even know what I think anymore. I, you know, it was interesting. Yeah, know. What's interesting is that uh, Jared Ivy said it was the LSU game, not not Alabama, not Lane Kiffin. It was the LSU game that was the first big fracture for them a year ago. You know that that led. He he thinks that the slide started there, not later. Yeah. Well, you'll remember because you lived in the state at the time. I'll get. I'll answer the question in a second. But you'll remember that. Uh, when Dennis Franchoni was strongly considering taking the Texas A&M job, Alabama lost an Iron Bowl at home where they were the heavily favored team. It was a beat-up Auburn team starting a fourth-team running back. And Alabama was like, I think, nine and, let's say, 11 games, you know, maybe like eight and two or nine and one or something like that. I mean, it was one of the best teams Alabama had had in quite a while. And Alabama players, and Auburn fans get so pissed about this too, but Alabama players to this day that were on that team say that week was totally different. That I, you know, we didn't know what was going on, but we knew the week of preparation for the Iron Bowl was not what any other week of preparation had been under Dennis Franchoni. So I think frequently players, even though they might not know what's going on, they do notice a difference and stuff like that. Um, but you remember that game, Rob? I mean, you were in Brian oh, yeah. Stadium for it. It yeah. was, if I remember right, it was really cold. Yeah. And uh, Trey Smith ended up having a big yep. game uh, yep. for Auburn. They were down. Like you said, I think they were down three running backs. Yeah, and, uh, they played really well defensively, and and Smith had a big game, and they made a couple yep. of plays. I, I can't remember all the details, but I do remember going into that game expecting Alabama to win and uh, Auburn winning kind of handedly. Yep, it was a weird, weird, weird game. Um, 
back to your question though I, I you know I think Kevin still is at least historically been a little more aggressive uh, as a defensive coordinator than Pete Golding um, you know still's just an experienced guy that uh, Nick Saban was a huge Pete Golding fan I mean when Pete Golding would get criticized it rarely came from Nick Saban in fact he would spend a lot of time defending him so I don't mean to say I don't mean what I'm about to say to sound like a criticism of Pete Golding I promise you it's not but I do think Kevin Still is a guy that has the respect of Nick Saban from years that they have coached together and against one another that still could probably push back against Saban a little bit and maybe in places Pete Golding couldn't. And on Saban's part, there's probably a trust factor from all those years of Kevin Still where Nick Saban can hand off a lot to Still that maybe he didn't to Pete Golding. Maybe Pete never earned that trust for Saban. So, you know, I think in a lot of ways, it, it looks like a comfortable hire, and that normally sounds bad, but I don't know that it is necessarily bad in this situation, that it is a comfortable hire. So I, I think Kevin still will bring a different type of approach than what Pete Golding had for Alabama. And for Pete Golding with Kevin, I, you know, I'll be interested to see how that goes, because in a lot of ways, when you're a defensive coordinator under, under Nick Saban, much like probably being an offensive coordinator under Lane Kiffin, you're always going to be overshadowed by your head coach. If you do anything well, it's because you're Nick Saban's defensive coordinator. If you do anything poorly, it's because you must not be living up to the Nick Saban standard or listening to him because Saban's viewed, you know, for a lot of reasons as a, as a defensive genius. So I will be interested to see Pete Golding out from under that wing a little bit. My guess would be given a lot more liberty under Lane Kiffin than he was under Nick Saban to see. I think there's a chance both things are really successful. And that you don't look back at Pete Golding as if people think he got run off by Nick Saban. I think he'll go, I think he'll flourish a little bit at Ole Miss. I like Pete Golding. I think he's a good football coach. It was really puzzling to me what happened at times in Tuscaloosa. But I think being out from under Nick Saban, he might actually flourish a little bit under Lane Kiffin. He's proving to be a really good recruiter here, too. Yeah. There were people who I don't know whether this was fair or not. It just was part of the deal when you coach with Saban for as long as you do there are people that are like well yeah you went there because you have their players and you can recruit there because you're recruiting to the A and you're all, all that stuff and again that's not completely fair but it's not completely unfair either I mean it's it's Saban has had such a run of success that that kind of thing is going to accompany him all right well I want to yeah okay. real quick if I can say this on Pete Golding too Neil and you know this I you know some of it public some of it not he had some family there's some personal, I'm not even going to say some personal issues here in Tuscaloosa. So I think maybe sometimes getting in a different world and maybe in, in, in his case, he's going to have a little more of a uh, expanded family unit, unit around him. Those things have a way of positively affecting you at times. So I, I do think maybe it'll be even a healthier uh, personal situation for him in Oxford too. So I, I just, I think, I think he'll be successful there. I, I like the Pete Golding hire by, by Lane Gibson. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with everything you just said. Um, all right, let's switch to the other side of the state. Uh, the the Reverend Freeze getting ready for uh, his his first uh, his first revival there at Auburn. Uh, I'm being mean. I'm sorry. Uh, I need to stop. How do you think Hugh Freeze is going to do right off the bat on the planes? So there are uh, there there's some knowns and some unknowns. Um, as we record this, and I guess this could change at any moment, but there is still this off the field situation that involved a sexually explicit video. Um, I was going to ask you about it. That has been, yeah, it's been tied to the Auburn football program. And Neil, really, all we know, there, there, there are two, I think, things that we know here that show you the level uh, that this has reached is number one, any comment made on this has been made by the school. And you've done this long enough to know. There's a level of seriousness when a comment is made by the athletic department, and it amps up when it's made by the school. Um, so the fact that the only comment on this has come from Auburn University, not Auburn Athletics, is not an insignificant uh, fact as well. Number two, in that statement, there were plural suspensions, indefinite suspensions, not an indefinite suspension of a player, Jarquez Hunter, whose name has been attached to this. And to be fair, you don't even know if Hunter is one of the suspended players, but his name was the name that was attached to the Twitter account that released these sexually explicit videos. And there are multiple suspensions. So 
that's really all anybody factually knows. Now, buddy, if you want to get in the weeds and talk about message board rumors, there's some wild ones out there. I've seen but them. none of that. Yeah, none of that has been proven. None of it has been reported by any reliable organization. Um, I also will say, though, do not discount something just because it's on a message board. I've seen plenty of stories that started out at what looked like just a message board rumor fire that ended up actually being true, Neil. So uh, I, I am not just going to discount a story because, oh, it's only on the message board. Some of that stuff ends up being true. And if some of this stuff is true, you're going to have more than just a running back you've got to worry about. But th that's just an unknown at this point. And until you know some facts on that, that be that is a that is a black cloud that's potentially hanging out there that could affect anywhere from one to multiple considerable contributors on Auburn's team. I think this is a fair question because I, I was in that state and did a lot of reporting when the Mike Price thing happened. And that started as just this rumor that just yeah. kind of came out. And again, I'm not accusing Hugh Freeze of anything, but I am curious, is there in any world where Hugh Freeze is attached to this? Not the not the act, but the reaction to the video and the, what happened to players. Is there is there any world where that involves him you know i'll point out on the mike price thing because you were the lead reporter on that nobody did a better job of reporting that story than you thank you um in, in your time at the mobile press register and you know this that like when that first that story first came out there were a lot of salacious details that you're like okay there's some truth in this story but most of that stuff can't be true and as you dug you found you know what? Most of that stuff is actually true. I mean, there were there were some crazy details in that story that actually ended up things you had that you could report on the record. And, yeah. and that, that's what's crazy about it. So just because, like, I mean, again, that's a perfect example of just because something sounds crazy on a message board does not mean it's untrue. I, I don't think at this moment, at this moment, there there would appear, and I, I do, well, at this moment, there, there would appear to be no involvement by Hugh Freeze in any of this. I don't think anybody's even suggested that. But I think the fear would be, if you're an Auburn fan, is because of the nature in which Hugh Freeze got this job, that there were um, mitigating circumstances that ran him out of Oxford and had him as the coach at Liberty. And you had to look at those circumstances and say, we think this is a reformed man, but we're also going to keep him on a very short leash because of his past. Mm -hmm. Um you can't discount that when you say, could he potentially get sucked into this and somehow involved? Not that he would have any firsthand involvement in it, but his reaction, was it too slow? Was there a culture? You know, all those questions have to be asked because of his past, honestly. So I don't, I don't think it's outside of the realm of possibility that if some of what you read on the message boards on this story happens to come to light, that it could in some way impact Hugh Freeze and his time at Auburn. I don't think there's any doubt about it. And he doesn't inherit this tremendously talented no. team either. I mean, I know they, they have the AU on the helmet and all the tradition and all the things that come with Auburn, and I'm not belittling that at all. They have a, a storied tradition. They, they've they competed for championships and won championships and had the Heisman Trophy winners and the whole thing. But they weren't very good last year, and they weren't very talented. They were they were not good. It wasn't by accident that they lost all those games. Um how much could this impact his ability to get that going and to rebuild quickly when you have this kind of scandal hanging over you? I, yeah, I don't, I don't think it, it affects you right away unless you're losing, you know, players for you know, permanent suspension or an extended period of time on the field and, and their schedule does start favorably. So even if it were two or three games, you could probably work past that. But once it gets into the conference play, it becomes a brutal schedule for Auburn and, and in places. I do think it's a manageable schedule overall, but in places it can be a brutal conference schedule. All of that said, um, you're right about the roster. I mean, you could make an argument, and, and these are just subjective arguments, but you could make an argument that Auburn's roster is in the bottom third of the conference. Yeah. And people Easy. love to point – yeah, people love to point the finger at Brian, Brian Harson on that, and he certainly contributed to it, but it started under Gus Malzahn. Gus was not a dynamic recruiter. He had coasted a little bit at the end, and it's what eventually caught up with him. And, you know, Brian Harson then replaced him, and he was not a dynamic recruiter. So it just, you know, average recruiting class stacked on average recruiting class. You have attrition. You have departures in the portal. And all of a sudden, you know, Hugh Freeze takes this thing over, and he won't say this publicly. He has alluded to this, by the way, but he won't publicly say, boy, this roster sucks. But he took it over and scanned the roster, and he's like, I got to have some help. 
they are up to, as we speak right now, Neil, they're up to 20 people out of the transfer pool. 20. I mean, they're, they're going to start the year with almost a quarter of their roster having transferred in, including in all likelihood their starting quarterback in Peyton Thorne. Uh, they, they, he hammered the recruiting transfer portal and defensive line. I mean, he, it's, he looked at a lot of spots and said, you got to have some help right away right here to even compete in the SEC. One more thing before we uh, before I let you go, I know you got you got some sure. stuff to do. Um, you're in you're in Birmingham. You cover a lot of SEC stuff. You look at uh, you look at everything that that happens around the country. There's still a lot of realignment talk that bubbles. There's a lot of talk about what the Big Ten number is going to be. The SEC meetings aren't far away. We're going to start hearing some numbers there. If I ask you to look into your crystal ball, five years. What's the what's the landscape from an alignment standpoint look like in five years? So, you know, I, I have heard any future recruitment would probably come from the ACC rather than anything further out west. I think I think the SEC got the teams they wanted out west in Texas and Oklahoma. I mean, if you go rob the Big 12, say, who do you want? We want Texas and Oklahoma. OK, they got them. I mean, who else are you going to want for the Big 12? So I think they would now look east a little bit. Um, and you would automatically say, okay, well, Florida State and Clemson, that's the two programs that either have the best tradition in the ACC or they're, they're doing it the best right now. Um, but those are not the two names I have heard most tied to the SEC. The two names I've most heard, I think, might surprise some people, NC State and Virginia Tech. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are the two names I've heard the most. And you, you throw those names out and people are like, uh, I beg your pardon? You know what, though, um, you say that and, and 10 years ago – those were the two names that I heard a lot too when they yeah. were talking about hey yeah. maybe maybe they'll expand by four, right? So I think those are programs. So NC State brings the Raleigh Durham television market, which is not a terrible TV market. I think that's a top twenty five TV market in North Carolina there, and it is in that market. NC State is still the big team. I know North Carolina and Duke have bigger brands nationally, but in that market, NC State's still the big team. Blacksburg doesn't necessarily bring you the Richmond market is okay. You get a little bit of the DC market maybe, but you know, what it brings you is a program where the, the, the fans more resemble an SEC, you know, fan base than any of the other ones in the ACC. Now, the interesting thing to me, and I, I don't know this to be fact, you may have dug into this more than I have, but the issue that the ACC teams have is not getting an exit from the uh, ACC. I think that's 120 million right now. It's getting out of this grant of right. So every ACC team handed over their media rights through the ACC to ESPN. So ESPN's got their media rights. And if Virginia, for instance, jumped to the Big Ten, they would have to pay the $120 million exit fee. And for 13 more years, their home games are owned by ABC and ESPN, unless Fox, NBC, and CBS could negotiate a deal to get them out of that. So it makes me wonder that if there were a bigger – fish that the sec wanted from the acc the fact that the sec has a deal with espn they could probably make that happen a little easier than say the big 10 could now i don't know if that would change the sec shopping list any but to me i just wonder how big a factor that is like if the sec went to espn and said okay look um north carolina is going to pay the 120 million dollar exit fee you've got their media rights we need to fold that into our sec deal with the with the with the with ESPN looking at it and say, okay, yeah, that works for us. Let's do that. How does all that work? You know? So it yeah. seems to me it'd be easier for an ACC team to fold into the SEC than it would be the Big Ten. So I wonder how much that changes the shopping list for the SEC, if any at all. Yeah, because the two schools that I've heard the most are UNC and UVA. Mm -hmm. So same states, different schools. Um I don't know. It's 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 really fascinating, well, and I keep waiting. I keep waiting for Notre Dame to make a decision because Notre Dame has told NBC, "Hey, we want eighty million. And to this point, NBC hasn't said, "Yeah, sure thing." So yeah. you know, I mean, maybe maybe that changes everything. And and then you know, Washington, Oregon, they're willing to jump to the pack to the Big Ten even on a lesser number just to get the hell away yeah. from the 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 carnage that is what's left of the Pac-12. So. I mean, yeah. I just think I think as the playoff starts, it's one thing, you know, you've talked about this before. It's kind of like in football. You can in, in the month of May, you can go through football schedules and go win, win, loss, win, win. Yeah. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. But in the heat of the moment, it becomes emotional. You know, the win, win, yeah. loss, and after the loss in September, it's let's fire everybody.
Nobody says that in May. You don't go, you know what? I think we're going to lose the third game by the coach. And so I think right now we're at that stage of the realignment thing where if you're in the room at UNC or Virginia, you know that there's this huge financial disparity that's coming, but it's not here yet. And so you're not caught up in the emotion of it. When the emotion of yeah. it, the actual money comes, there's going to be this rush to, hey, you know what? We got to get out of this. I mean, however we do it, we got to do it. We got to get out. We can't do this for 12 years. We have to get out of it. So I kind of think that's what's coming. Well, I, I just, you know, I think North Carolina and Virginia view themselves as these great academic institutions. North Carolina is a little funny. They were literally running a diploma mill yeah. at one point in athletics. Uh, now, Virginia is a different story. Um, so I've always, you know, I've always, I'm with you. North Carolina, Virginia seems more attractive. But you wonder if Virginia would really look down their noses at having to be in the academic league of the Southeastern Conference rather than the academic league of the Big Ten. Something I frankly don't care about one way or the other. But you know people in Virginia do. Yeah, I, think, and it would, I, I think it would just come down to kind of the, the yeah. somebody doing the practical thing and saying, all right, let's talk about money. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, because you're at 120 and, – and by the way, any legal analyst that has examined these grant of rights contracts that the ACC schools have say they are unbreakable, wow. that these are ironclad, unbreakable contracts. Money fixes it all, but, I mean, what level would the money have to rise to if you're paying $120 million just to get out of the league? What level would the money have to rise to for ESPN to say, okay, you're, you're out? I mean, you could be talking about a quarter of a billion dollars just to get out of the ACC, get into the SEC, let's say, so let's say the deficit between the two is $30 million a year. That takes you a long time. I mean, you're a good decade before you've made up that exit fee and just to start turning a profit now. I mean, that's, oof, that's, a, that's a tough decision. Those are some tough checks to write and some tough checks to ask your money people to write. Last thing, it'll come up, I'm sure, in Destin a lot. What is your thought about when the final number comes down from whatever deal the SEC does with its TV rights? What how big of a number do you think that's going to be? I think it's going to be significant. I think there got to be a lot of people down the street from me here in Birmingham in that SEC office laughing at that Pete Thamel ESPN article about the Big Ten rights deal that apparently Kevin Warren completely butchered. Who would have thought, who would have thought that the more lasting error by Kevin Warren was not almost not playing the COVID season, but the actual <laughs> billion-dollar TV deal he worked out? I mean, it's a mess. They haven't got it signed yet. ESPN's been promised these primetime games that apparently the Big Ten can't reliably deliver at this point. Um, NBC was promised a title game by Kevin Warren that it wasn't his to give away Fox on the rights to it. And, I mean, it is a complete and total mess right now. Meanwhile, the SEC seems nice and neat and locked in with ESPN. And I'm sure Greg Sankey... Yeah, I'm sure Greg Sankey and the staff, when a lot of people were saying, oh, Big Ten one up you, huh? I'm sure right now he's laughing and saying, yeah, ask the Big Ten how good that contract is now. You know, when they, they might they might be $40 million off the top of that contract. they got to pay Fox just to make good for that Big Ten game, championship game they're losing. So it's going to be a significant number, and it seems to be a more solid number with more happy people than what the Big Ten has. And ultimately, isn't that really the race now, Neil? You know, who's got the better number, the Big Ten or the SEC? That's the way it's going to be for the remainder of college football. Um, but I think everybody's going to be thrilled. I think now the, the problem becomes, okay, how do we deliver the TV product? Uh, ESPN is going to want as many conference games. That means we need a nine or 10 conference game schedule to, uh, to provide them. So, you know, everybody's, I know a lot of y'all don't want a nine game schedule, but you're going to want these checks. Here's how we deliver the check. We got to have this nine game schedule. Yeah, I've said this so many times. It's, it's irritated a lot of people because it's, it's kind of easy and fun, I guess to blame commissioners for when you feel like your school's not handled as fairly as big school, whatever. I'm like, yeah, but always remember Kevin Warren and the big 10 were not only willing, but were eager to cancel the college football season in 2020. That's right. Yep. And it was Greg Sankey. Greg probably will not, uh, would, would, would come on and go, no, it wasn't me. It was other people. Nope. It was Greg Sankey. Greg Sankey is the reason, the reason that that thing, that that momentum towards full cancellation, and I guess that was late July, early August of 2020, he was the reason that that momentum slowed. His his yep. 
his saying, hey, we might have to, but we don't have to yet. Hold on. Let's just let's yeah. take a deep breath. Let's wait a minute. That reaction saved it. And people just underestimate yeah. how much money and everything else that was saved, how much damage was prevented by his approach to that. And in my world, that kind of, he'd have to screw up a lot of stuff before I'd go, no, nope, no, nope, Greg, you know what? You've lost all of your cachet. I, I, th I think he's the guy that saved college football in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I realize it would have come back, but I just don't think people understand the damage that would have been done had there been no 2020. Had it not happened, had you not played that season at all. Especially when you go back and look at it and say, wow, they, they, they did that and nobody died in the stands. Well, the dentist died. Oh, no. He said, I think he said how many people would die. Um, and yeah. then, I mean, so. Oh, I know. Yeah. And, you know, nope. no, nobody died. Nobody died. And everybody seemed to do okay. And, and they managed. I mean, so yeah, he, I mean, he said, I've said it to him before and you're right. He shrinks away from it. He's like, no, 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 no. It wasn't just me, but he saved college football. I mean, yep. without the leadership of the SEC, the ACC was not going to jump in and do it. The Big 12 was not going to jump in and do it. And if none of those did, there was no reason for the Pac-12 to eventually play that five-game schedule and the Big Ten to eventually play the schedule they played. I mean, those were not going to happen. The only so reason those things happened – yeah, the only reason those things happened was because that weekend came where the SEC played games. Yep. And the Big Ten looked around and went, God, we look like idiots, don't we? I mean, their, their commissioner was at one of the games. I mean, like, they're not playing and their commissioner's at the game. And you're like – what what what's going on here? How yeah. can Kevin Warren be? I know his son is playing. I get that, but he's at a game, and his whole conference is saying, "Well, it's not safe enough to have games." I mean, it just really made no sense. Idiotic. Hey, uh, as always, appreciate the time. Congratulations to your daughter. I know she's getting ready to uh, Thank you. head off to South Alabama to get her college career started. So uh, enjoy the last few months with her, because I'll just go ahead and tell you. You can ask me how I know. Once they leave, it's kind of not the same again. I know <laughs> they come back in a suitcase um, and it's, different. Yep. it's different. Yep. I know. I know. I'm looking, she's excited about it. So that's why, that's why it helps me there. She's excited about it. So uh, I say, go keep those grades up. So that money keeps rolling in from the university of South Alabama. How about doing that for me? Absolutely. Hey, uh, enjoy your Memorial day weekend. Thanks for being with us. Uh, you too, Neil. Thank you. It's always fun. That was Ryan Brown of the next round. Really appreciate his time on uh, the show. It's always, uh, always good to visit with him. He helps us so much in um, football season and then throughout the year. Our next sponsor is Athletic Greens. Let me tell you a little bit about our friends at Athletic Greens. I gave AG1 a try because I wanted better gut health, sustained energy, immune system support. I hated taking pills. I take AG1 every afternoon to break my fast. I know I love knowing I'm doing something good for my body, giving my body the nutrition it craves, covering my nutritional bases. Covering my nutritional bases for the day literally couldn't be easier. It's why I trust Athletic Greens. I just mix one small scoop of AG1 with water, and that's done. I also like that it costs less than $3 a day. It's pretty good if you ask me. It's a really effective daily habit. With the highest quality sourced ingredients, it's a win-win. If a comprehensive solution is what you need for your supplement routine, then Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash mpw. That's athleticgreens.com slash mpw. Check it out. Now back to the myperfectfranchise.net hotline. We're going to talk about the Texas A&M Aggies, all the drama there, Jimbo Fisher, Bobby Petrino, and the rest. Olin Buchanan does a great job covering the Aggies for texags.com. Here's our visit. I think you'll enjoy it. Olin Buchanan of texags.com joins us. Uh, Olin does as good a job covering Texas A&M as anybody does. Knows this league, knows the old Southwest Conference, the Big 12, all that stuff. We're, before we got going, we were talking about our kids. And Olin, when you and I first met each other, our kids were little. Now you've got a kid in college. I've got my oldest out of college. We're old, man. We, we look old, but I, we, I think we feel young, right? Uh, it depends on uh, what time of the day. <laughs> <laughs> the, the later it gets the older i feel yeah i feel you i'm kind of the opposite i wake up and i feel old and by the end of the day i'm I tr i've tricked myself into thinking that i can do whatever um 
All right, let's talk A and M. All right, you just interviewed me about Ole Miss. I'll interview you about A and M because A and M once again is one of the most fascinating stories in the league. Um, the last couple of years, there's been all sorts of hype about A and M. They have not lived up to that hype. I'm curious, in your opinion, why is that? Why has A and M struggled the way that it has struggled the last couple of years, despite the fact that they've recruited from a 24/7 and on three and rivals, ESPN, everybody, everybody has said, "Hey, they're recruiting at a at a premium level." Well, um, you know, first of all, I think you look at the quarterback situation and hadn't been as good as uh, as they had hoped and quite, quite frankly, as they said it was. And then I think you really have to take a strong look at uh, Jimbo Fisher's uh, handling of the offense. Uh, A&M is three and eight in their last 11 SEC games. Uh, one of those was a win over Auburn where they didn't score an offensive touchdown. In all, in all three of those games, they've had a big defensive score that's changed momentum. Uh, and the other ones, uh, you know, you, you see them struggle to score, quite frankly, quite often. So um, I think it starts with uh, the quarterback situation and just there are some that I guess are smarter than me. They say Jimbo's offense has been archaic, and maybe it is, right? Uh, I think their offensive line let them down uh, last year. They had a they, they did to be fair they had a ton of injuries, but still um, that doesn't explain losing to Appalachian State, Auburn, uh, some of the games they lost to, uh, or they lost just uh, you can't just blame it all on injuries because you know other teams have issues too. All right, so let's dive into this a little bit because I'm fascinated by it. So two years ago, Haynes King wins the job. Mm -hmm. He gets hurt at Colorado, I think. Yeah, on the, on the, I want to say the second play of the second series. Okay, got got hurt in that game. Um, Zach Calzada came in, quarterback the rest of the season. They had the big win over Alabama with the the fourth quarter where Calzada looked like an NFL player, frankly. Yeah. Um. But what we kept hearing out of College Station, and I'm not picking, I'm just, I'm just kind of establishing the narrative here. What we kept hearing was, well, if, if Haynes King were here, you guys, it would be, this would be different. And then last year, Haynes King was back, um, and he didn't look all of that. Uh, Calzada goes to Auburn and doesn't really pan out, doesn't play on a bad Auburn team um, where they fired the coach midway through the season. A&M never really had quarterback play to speak of and it makes you wonder is this is this a evaluation thing is this a, is this a development thing or is it as you referenced a minute ago is this Jimbo's play calling putting quarterbacks in a place where it's difficult for them to succeed well I think at this point you have to figure it's you know it's at least to some degree all of those things okay um, now they have a quarterback this year they're really high on you've heard that before but we've actually seen him play. We've seen him play well, and I'm talking about Connor Wigman. Yeah, um, yeah. He looked he looked the part uh, late in the season. Right. Well, he you know he started four games last year. Um, don't want to make excuses for him, to, but I'll say two of them were were not impressive. There were extenuating circumstances, but could have still could have been better. Uh, and then two of them, one against Ole Miss, and one against LSU. He looked pretty good. Yeah, for sure. So that, that, you know, if he doesn't continue to develop, then I think you really do start uh, demanding more answers. And I, I don't mean media demanding. I mean, everybody that follows Texas A&M. Um, because he is probably the most celebrated quarterback coming here. Coming here since Kyler Murray. Now, Kyler, of course, he was the real deal. He just was real deal somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but, and that was, you know, a different coaching staff as well. Sure. So uh, there's a lot of uh, hope surrounding him. And yet Jimbo has said that he's not necessarily the starting quarterback, that they really like Max Johnson. And I will say this for what it's worth, and I don't think a spring game is worth that much, but for what it's worth, Max did look like the better guy in the spring game. Now, but, but going back to your, your question, um, 
quarterback's been a, a big letdown. And it could be uh, they just – they just the evaluation was flawed or everybody makes a mistake sometimes. I'll say this. We thought that uh, that Haynes King was you know going to be that answer, but the more you watched him, you saw a guy that they – Talked about how fast he was, but wouldn't run. What's the point of being a dual quarterback if you have an option opportunity to run and you won't take it? Is it because you got hurt running against Colorado and now you're apprehensive about getting hurt? Is it because Jimbo has coached that out of you? Because, hey, don't want to run because, you know, you got to look and see if you can't find that pass downfield. I can't tell you how many times we'd be standing up in that or sitting up there in the press box and you'd see the field open up and there's 10 to 20 yards just here take them and Haynes would just wait and wait and wait and end up throwing a a a pass that they're they're, they had no chance of completing and you're like you know what are you doing and then that then we the more you'd watch you'd find out his arm's not that strong and yet so why are you throwing a deep out against South Carolina that you know it's a duck and it turns into an interception that leads to an early touchdown so um uh zach calzada against alabama looked like a great quarterback he did in every every other game i just came away tip usually very unimpressed and i remember this time last year i had radio stations from auburn calling me up and i would you know and i would tell them i say from auburn from alabama that favorite auburn and i would tell them uh you know guys i'm not saying he can't get better but don't judge him on what you saw against Alabama because I, I saw him against Arkansas throw an interception off his set off his center's helmet to the to end the game, you know. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a chicken or the egg thing. Is it the quarterbacks weren't good, the offense wasn't good because the quarterbacks weren't good, or the quarterbacks weren't good because the offense weren't good? Uh, maybe this year is going to determine that because I think we've seen enough of Connor Wigman think he could be pretty good. And I've seen a lot of Bobby Petrino over the years to uh, to know that that he's a hell of an offensive coach, an elite play caller. Um, I was in, I was actually in Fayetteville the Saturday night that uh, Missouri State gave Arkansas all it wanted last year. I mean, into the fourth quarter, that was a Bobby Petrino masterpiece for three and a half quarters. He's now the offensive coordinator at Texas A and M. He leaves a head coaching gig to be the coordinator. Um. I know Petrino a little bit. He he has a, a very strong personality. Um, I don't know that he's the type that's going to let, even though Jimbo's his boss, I don't know that he's the type that's going to let Jimbo march all over him. How is this thing going to work in College Station with a, a head coach who loves to call plays and an offensive coordinator who gave up a head coaching gig to come to the SEC to call plays? Well, I think that's the seventy-two million dollar question, <laughs> and, I, and I say that because that's roughly the buyout, right? Yeah. Uh, I would say this, uh, just as someone who covers A and M, that's invested. You know, the the better they do, the better I'm going to do financially. <laughs> uh, that I would rather him bring in a guy like Petrino than maybe a younger guy that's an up and coming offensive mind and all this. Because I think Jimbo Fisher, I think older guys are more likely to listen and defer to their contemporaries. Uh, uh, just my my guess. And that um, if Bobby Petrino says, hey, this is what we need to do, that Jimbo Fisher is more likely to listen to that. Plus, um, you know Bobby Petrino, so you know his history. He left the uh, Atlanta Falcons in season. Well, if Jimbo has made promises and about how much control Bobby's going to have on the offense, and we don't know if that's the case because, quite frankly, they haven't made Bobby Petrino available to be interviewed. But um, uh, if that's – but if let's say there are promises made to get him there and then those are reneged on, then uh, what would, would – it, would it surprise anybody – if it came to that, if a frustrated Bobby Petrino just said, I'm out of here. And if that happened, just how much more um, controversy, how much more scrutiny does that put on Jimbo? So I think that uh, I'm actually 
relatively confident that Jimbo's putting the offense in Petrino's hands for the reasons that we just talked about. $72 million is a ton of money. It's a ton of money anywhere. It, even, even for Texas A&M with the deep pockets in this economy, $72 million is a lot of money. How bad would it have to get for $72 million to become palatable? Mm, I think, uh, First of all, I heard last year, you know, from talking to the people that not, not involved in the, with the university directly, not employees, but, you know, big boosters. And A&M has a lot of billionaire boosters um, that they had the money last year if they decided to do that. Okay. Now, this is just guys talking that supposedly sure. know these things. Sure. Well, you're, you're, you're connected and they do have a lot of money there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, the from my understanding, the money's there if they decide to to move that in that direction. Uh, I would think the really strange number would be eight wins. Uh, if it gets to eight wins, I, I wonder, you know, do, do you say, hey, they make showed enough improvement and let's do everything you can to keep that 2022 recruiting class together as much as possible and see what can happen next year? Or uh, do you say, you know what? We fired his predecessor for averaging eight wins. You know, at what point do you say enough's enough? Um, I think nine, he's good. I think less than eight, I would think uh, a change is coming. Again, they fired Kevin Sumlin for winning eight games a year, and he never right. had a losing season. Uh, yeah, so, Jimbo, uh, Jimbo had a losing season, and there were times last year that it looked like a program that was careening out of control. It was now. I, I try to be fair on both sides. They, they had a. I, I I don't know if you're aware. They had just a, a, a ungodly amount of injuries, and on top of that, when they played Florida, they had a flu outbreak. Right. And like, it was bad. Yeah. You know, it was bad. So they had like every kind of bad luck that could happen happened. So I don't want to completely just dismiss Jimbo. I mean, on, on the on the flip side, I mean, if if the if if the uh, I should know him. He's friends with my daughter. If Cameron Little makes the kick that night in in Arlington, a kick that he makes nine times out of ten, they probably lose the Arkansas game, and it's even more of a disaster. It could have been. It could have been. But you know what? They also – here's how you go yeah, back. Yeah. Right, right. If you, if you add one touchdown, and this is what you're looking for, from I guess, from Bobby Petrino. If you add one touchdown to every game, just one, A&M goes 10-2. and two. So – how close, you know. So that, and that is what they brought him in for. And that's what will be absolutely fascinating. So here's my question. Let's say for the sake of this conversation, in this scenario that, that Bobby Petrino comes in, Jimbo lets him coach. Uh, let's say that they have an average amount of health. Every team's going to lose players over the course of a season, but there's, there's no just dramatic injury bug. And that things stabilize offensively. Is the rest of the roster as good as people like me think it is? Because they, on paper, man, defensively, it looks like DJ Durkin has a lot to work with defensively, that there are weapons everywhere. They, they're, they're good enough up front on offense, et cetera, et cetera. Is, is, is the roster talented enough to win 10 games? Well, I, I think it is. I think that last year was a complete failure of coaching. I think the, the roster was better than the, the coaching, even with the injuries. Right. Uh, I think, and some of that was on DJ Durkin too. I, I'm still trying to figure out why he ever would go to a three man front. Uh, you, you saw the Ole Miss game. They came out three man front. Ole Miss went down there, uh, right down the field, like, like, you know, the hot knife through butter cliche. Um, A&M's, the, the weakness of their defense uh, is the linebackers. And so, why you don't have two, why are you going to put four out there? Right? They even take a took a freshman defensive lineman and started playing him at linebacker so they could run a three four. It just made no sense. Um, and yet, you know, well, you saw Ole Miss. Well, you know, Ole Miss run for like three hundred ninety yards or, or two hundred some, something outrageous against. Yeah, had a huge had a huge game on the ground, sure. Yeah, uh, and a lot of teams did. Uh, and yet, somehow, they only gave up and they had no pass rush at all. And somehow, A and M only gave up like twenty one points a game. So I don't know what smoke and mirrors he did to pull that off. So if they can get better against the run, and maybe they will, maybe they won't. Here's why they might, okay? 
Uh, last year, Edron Cooper and Chris Russell were the linebackers that, that first year starters. Okay. Sometimes second guys are better in their second year than, than they are in the first year starters. Um, they had uh, their best defensive lineman. Thank you, Mississippi is McKinley Jackson. He missed half the year with injury. Um, their, their best pass rusher, uh, Fidel Diggs, missed half the year with injury. Um, and then the rest, the guys that were typically filling in were, were true freshmen. And, you know, you know this. I don't care how good you are, how talented you are. You're still a, an 18-year-old playing against grown men in the SEC, the especially the SEC West, the best conference and division in college football against now grown men who are also highly recruited guys. It's so, very difficult for, for true okay. freshmen. It's, it's, it's very rare that one, like what we saw with Harold Perkins last year, it's just, you, you don't see that often in the league. Right. And when, and, and when you do, it's usually uh, Jonah Williams at Alabama at tackle, right? You said Harold Perkins, it's usually one or two guys maybe that here and there that you cherry pick as this guy, but it's not, you know, four or five or six. There was a game against, uh, I want to say it was LSU where a and started s- seven true freshmen. Uh, so, uh, again, th- those sounds like excuses. I'm not meaning to. I'm trying to play the point-counterpoint of uh, Walter Nolan is a year experience, a year bigger, a year, you know, he looks bigger yet thinner, if, if that means anything to you. Sure. Uh, LT Overton, another freshman, uh, Shamar Stewart. Uh, those guys who are true freshmen playing in defensive line are now sophomores with a year of growth behind them. So maybe they will be better. So I think you can look at it and find reasons to say, oh, yeah, they could be a lot better. But then you could probably look at it and say, yeah, and you would have been even worse if a guy doesn't, against Arkansas, doesn't doink, uh, doesn't have the oink doink and miss uh, 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 what should have been a game winning field goal. Last year, I'll ever be able to ask this question. Um, when you look at the West, how do you sort of see it shaking out? Well, every year I'm going to pick Alabama until, uh, until you know, until it's just not the smart thing to do. And I look at LSU, and I think LSU is probably about the same team they were last year. You know, good enough. I don't know if they're going to win the West, but good enough to win it. Yeah. Uh, and then I look at the potential. And potential is a bad word, right? Because it means you hadn't done it yet. But I look at the potential of A&M. Uh, I look at Arkansas. And who's not going to be impressed with what they have at quarterback and running back? But what else do they have? They yeah, a, whole, a whole bunch of transfer portal guys there. I mean, right. they, they're they like they, – they don't get the pub that Ole Miss gets for the portal, but they're pretty damn dependent on it. They really are. The, uh, bring in – they brought in receivers. They uh, spe- a lot of guys on defense. A couple from uh, I think Missouri, uh, like Trajan Jeffcoat, who's mm-hmm. been good. Um, but you know, I think the strength of their defense last year were their linebackers and Drew Sanders and Bumper Pool are both gone. Yep. They were they were last I think dead last in the country in pass defense last year. Yep. So um, they've, they've they've dove into the portal completely on in their secondary. And I don't know what to make of Mississippi State with uh, you know. God bless his soul without Mike Leach. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, it's funny. I look at uh, Ole Miss and I think A&M has more talent than Ole Miss. And I see Ole Miss constantly out coach and out play A&M. So I typically go by talent. You know, when we go to the SEC media days in, uh, gosh, less than two months. Yeah. And we're asked to rank our, you know, to pick it, I'm probably going to say Alabama one, LSU two, A and M three, Ole Miss four, Arkansas five, um, and then uh, uh, Auburn six, Mississippi State six, Auburn seven. I, I was trying to say, do I want to go to Auburn or Mississippi State? Because uh, I just don't know what to think about Mississippi State. But I'd probably go Mississippi State six and Auburn seven. Yeah, I can't argue that. I, I I'm still contemplating picking LSU just because, uh, you know, I and you're right about Alabama. It's so foolish to count them out, and and um, and I'm not counting them out. But I was a big Bryce Young fan, 
And uh, I watched him single-handedly beat Ole Miss in, in November in Oxford, and then the Panthers picked him number one overall despite the fact that there are some stature questions about him. I just I just think he has it in spades and spades and spades and spades, and I just don't know how you replace that on that team. I agree. Look, Alabama was 10-2, and two, right? They were two plays away from being in the playoff, but they were also maybe just a couple of plays from being uh, – Eight and four or worse. Oh, you know, they, they could have easily lost to Texas. Uh, they 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 could have easily lost to Ole Miss. They could have, frankly, they 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 played Russian roulette a little bit in in um in Fayetteville, and I'm I'm forgetting a game that they and and M was on the two yeah. yard line. And, and they could have easily lost to Texas A&M. Jimbo called a play that I'll never understand. So they were that close, and then so you say, all right, now you're gonna you're gonna take Bryce Young. And Tyler Steen and Jameer Gibbs and Will Anderson and Henry Toa Toa and John Battle off that team that was close to being eight and four and tell me they're going to be better. Now they might be because Alabama typically reloads better than anybody, but I'm with you. I think Bryce Young is a, the next guy is not as good as Bryce Young. And now they're, look, they're going for the backup quarterback at Notre Dame to replace him. I just, but I still just, no, it's, it's like uh, they, they've earned it in 15 years. I mean, you, you don't yeah. you don't have 15, 16, 17 years in this league the way that that Alabama has had, and 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 by accident, you 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 do it with elite coaching and elite talent and elite recruiting and elite development and elite everything. I mean, credit where uh, tons of credit. It, we, I don't know that anybody will ever pull it off again, but um, I kind of wonder. I but yeah, I'm with you. I, 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 at the end of the day, I'll probably put Alabama number one. And when someone goes, why? I'll just say, because. <laughs> because for Alabama. I mean, you know, they've earned it. That's why they've earned that spot. But, but at the same time, they appear on paper today to be more vulnerable than usual. Yes. Because last year, again, they had their issues, but they had Bryce Young to bail them out a lot of times. And uh, I just question that Tyler Buckner or uh, the kid Jalen Melrow is going to be able to do that on a week to week basis. All right. Last thing you're there in the state you watched years ago, Texas A&M transition to the sec. We're a year away now from uh, Texas and Oklahoma, two programs that I know you, you, you hear a lot about in, in that state Two huge brands. No question about that. Two massive brands joining the league. How well are how's, uh, poorly, do you anticipate it going for Texas and Oklahoma joining the SEC at the off the jump? Uh, I think they're going to uh, have some. You know, I think they're going to have some problems, and, and that, I, and the reason how come I'm hesitant to say that is, look, when A and M came into the SEC, everybody dismissed them, and then they dang near won the the, the conference championship, and then people were dismissing Missouri, and they won the East two of their first three years. Yep. So, uh, but, but when I watch Texas and this is not meant to be just because I'm a, uh, an A&M guy that follows A&M. Well, I wouldn't ask you if I thought I was going to get nothing, but some kind of Homer answer. I I, I know that you, you look at this objectively and you follow them and you know what kind of talent they have and and what Sarkeesian is doing and all of those things. So I'm, I'm genuinely curious to get your, your thoughts. And, And they're getting better. But there's still a program right now that will go out and uh, lose to Kansas, that will uh, lose to TCU, which, okay, TCU was really good, but we saw what happened when they you know, played an SEC team. Um, that'll struggle. They would have lost to Iowa State last year, and an Iowa State guy dropped a touchdown pass in the last two minutes. I mean, it, it, he's at the 10, nobody's around him. He just dropped it, and it was their best receiver. Uh, they're a team that finishes in the Big 12 over the last 10 years, eight and four, seven and five, right? And we know that that game that they go play, say, at West Virginia, and they don't play well, but they're just better than them. We know, that doesn't happen in the SEC. If you're not on your game, you lose. Yeah, if you're not on your game when you go to Starkville, they get you. If you're not on your game when you go to uh, Columbia, South Carolina, they get you. I mean, oh, you I saw it. a couple of years ago, they went to they went to Arkansas and played 
an Arkansas team that ended up being a good Arkansas team. We go eight and four and Arkansas, not only beat them, but beat the hell out of them. And had there not been the play where I think Jefferson had a fumble that led to a touchdown for Texas, it's, it's like 48 to seven kind of win. I mean, it's a blowout game and you know, you, you know this, I mean, Texas A&M struggles to beat the Mississippi teams. I mean, and that's, yeah. that's before you get into Alabama and Georgia and LSU and Florida, if they get going, I mean, it's a brutal league. You, you know, that. it was, it was, uh, and here's the deal. We all know this in one game situation. You can get all pumped up to play, man. We're going to play this SEC team, and mm. you're pumped up, and you go out, and you might even win, or at the very least, go out in LSU's national championship year in Texas, plays them within a touchdown, and almost beat them. But can you do that the next week, and the next week, and the next week? And we know, you know, if you don't, then there's a good chance you're you're probably going to lose. And it was funny to me, you'll recall, uh, they beat Georgia in the Sugar Bowl four or five years ago, and they say, hey, we're back, we're back. And they weren't because, quite frankly, the Sugar Bowl now never means a whole lot to the SEC team because if you're the SEC team in the Sugar Bowl now, that means you just missed getting into the playoff. And I know right now they say, oh, yeah, that's just a sour grapes type of thing, even though it's true. Now, I know Alabama throttled Kansas State last year. But, but again, that was Bryce Young. Right. And and sometimes you're just better. but. Yeah. Typically, we saw Auburn lose uh, to Central Florida. We've seen Oklahoma beat Alabama. We've seen Utah beat Alabama. We've seen uh, Georgia lose to Texas. Mississippi, hasn't Ole Miss lost to like yeah, Baylor? Ole, Ole Miss lost to Baylor. And Ole Miss fans would say, well, Matt Corral got hurt in the first quarter of that game. And that's a legitimate beef. But yeah, the right. point is, is that they were having they, they, they were going to have their hands full with Baylor that night it, at, at a very minimum. To me, in that game, the the it typically – the the uh for the big 12 team the sugar bowl is a reward mm -hmm. for the sec team it's a consolation prize yeah it's a disappointment to some degree right. because you were that close to playing for something bigger so they beat georgia and say hey look man we can beat you know look we've already proved it we we can go to the sec and, you know texas fans uh they like to call themselves dbu for uh defensive backs university i say it's for delusional buffoons <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 I think that really, if you talk to the average Texas fan, they they think that the SEC won't be any more challenging than the Big Twelve. And you're like, all right. Uh, I think they'll. Uh, yeah, I saw a quote from Barry Switzer, and you might have saw this too. And Switzer, I don't know that I did. Oh, it was, yeah, you can Google it. Switzer was saying, uh, I don't think the OU folks understand what they're getting into. You know, so those that really understand football. Um, would anticipate that Texas and Oklahoma are going to have their growing pains, uh, just as, as A&M ha has. I don't think – I think what A&M did in 2012 is the exception to the rule, right? Um, uh, and it was and – and you know what? They had, they had an offense with five first-round draft choices on it. So it had a special college quarterback. Right, and he was one of the first-round draft choices, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and, and – and they didn't. They still didn't win the, the league. They didn't win the division. Um, so, uh, and I I know Texas is going to have Arch Manning. Maybe he's going to be as good as his uncles. Uh, but neither one of those uncles ever won an SEC championship, did they? No. It, it, no. I, well, Peyton did. Peyton, Peyton won an SEC title. Did, did he? Did. Okay, my bad. Yeah. I just remember him always losing to Florida, but my bad. But it was hard. He never won a national title because Florida kept getting in the way. And, and yeah, Eli got really close to getting Eli to the SEC close. title. Eli in got fact, really close. You know, I'm going to tell you this. This has nothing to do with what we were talking about, but uh, I covered the Cotton Bowl for like 15 consecutive years, 20 years in a row. But Or I should say like 19 or 20 years. The one I missed was – Ole Miss and Oklahoma State, right? Yep, yep. Because my son was due. And uh, what happened was, and, and wouldn't you know he was late, I said, <laughs> you know, uh, if my wife had, you know, been on on her game, I wouldn't have missed that streak. So yeah. I was looking forward to seeing Eli play, and I missed that. Well, I think the birth of your son is a, is, is a, is a legitimate consolation prize to missing a, a cotton ball. Well, I guess, but I was looking forward to that game. <laughs>
<laughs> well, hey, man, it's always great uh, catching up. I'll I'll see you in, in Nashville in a couple months at uh, SEC Media Days. Maybe we can do it again. I, I look forward to it, Neil. Thank right. you very much. Thank you, Owen. Take care. Again, our thanks to uh, both Ryan Brown and Owen Buchanan for their time today on Hand Raise Guys and the Oxford Exxon Podcast. We'll be back on Tuesday for another week of podcast here at MPW Digital. Until then, have a happy and wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Good night.